Can you, you guys can hear me? Cool? Awesome. Um, so I have the really exciting job of you've just all eaten and you want to go to sleep. And so I hope to both educate and entertain you. And so let's do this together. So first of all, the backstory. Hi, I'm Julia. Um, this is my first DjangoCon. I've never been to DjangoCon before. I am, I, I am so excited to be here. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I feel lucky to be in front of such a cool audience. I have learned so much already, um, and I feel like I am learning new things by the minute. I also wanted to quickly say thank you to the Pi Ladies. They are a fantastic organization. They are one of the main reasons that I am here today, and I, I am forever indebted to them. Um, so just a little bit, yes, absolutely. Bye, ladies, for the win, for the win. Um, so just a little bit about me, as you've never seen me at any of these conferences before. So I am an engineer by trade. Uh, I went to school for computer science, whatever that means. Um, and I spent a long time doing professional software development from the back end to the front end um, in large companies, in small companies. And so I've written this talk with an engineering perspective in hand. Um, it's also probably worthwhile for me to say that and we'll get to this a little bit more in the talk, that I never wrote Python before February of this year. And what, what on earth was I doing before? And that's a question I ask myself all the time. Um, so before Enlightenment, I was uh, writing a lot of Java. I was writing a lot of C++. I did some JavaScript, um, a little bit of Ruby on Rails. But honestly, like, I, I had never even heard of Django, um, and much less Python. So, Yesterday, at Mark's really fantastic talk about contributing to open source, he said, be very upfront about when you, when you open source code. And so I took that to mean be very upfront about what you're going to talk about. And I am going to, and today I am here because of this problem. And I think this talk is going to be really relevant and interesting because this problem. And Selena brought this up this morning when she said that this is not just a Silicon Valley bubble thing. It is very hard for any of us right now to hire engineers. And engineers are in huge demand. And if, if you have a LinkedIn profile, you know about this problem too. Because recruiters endlessly contact you all of the time. And what, what I think, th this is an interesting shift now. Because five to 10 years ago, you hire people because they knew your stack and they were Java experts or they were C gurus. And there are jobs that are really important to have that specific skill set. But now there's this shift where it becomes not everyone is a Django knot, and it becomes important that you hire amazing software engineers who can come up to speed on your stack. And if you're really awesome and you're curious and you're excited, you can learn anything. Um, I think that this quote really brings it home. And the gist of this is, you know, experience can be traded out. We can come up to speed. We can learn things. But culture and passion are not things that you can easily train for. So before we get deep down into the internals, just a really quick few disclaimers. So what this talk is not about is you're doing Rails, how to switch to Django, or you're doing PHP and you want to kill yourself and you want to switch to Django, <laughs> or anything along those lines. Um, this is more about you're an engineer, you understand how the web works, you've hopefully written software before, and you're jumping into learning Python and Django, and you're probably going to be working with a large code base. So this also isn't an intro to how to write your first app. There are many talks and many great tutorials that do that online. Um, and second, everybody learns differently, so your miles may vary. I'm going to give you my personal journey of um, the ups and downs, the, the craziness that I went through, and I'm going to give you some serious takeaways that I think will help you if you are a Python and Django sh shop, which you are here today, so you probably are, and you're hiring new engineers who, haven't, who don't know much about that framework. So, now, the adventure begins. So um, around January 2012 of this year, so you know, eight short months ago, I was at a startup, and I decided to quit my job. And I really was thinking about starting a company. And this isn't a decision to be taken lightly. And nor is this a talk about entrepreneurship and all the things that come along with that. If you ever want to talk about those things, I would love to talk about them with you later. But you know, I, I'm deciding what to do. And if you came to DjangoCon last year, you probably saw this fantastic designer give a talk about how she came up to speed on DjangoCon Django Con for designers, which is Tracy Osborne. So I've known Tracy for many years in Silicon Valley. And 
I, she had done a really fantastic job as a designer building a first prototype, but she needed to scale up and take the company to the next level, and she needed someone with an engineering background. And I, at the same time, you know, I'm doing my own soul searching, and I'm deciding what I want to do with my life um, as we all kind of hit those points. And I decide, okay, like, I want to do this. I'm going to join your company. We're, we're going to go in this together. But you know, at the time I joined her, we had a lot of production code. So it's, when I was giving this talk as a practice talk um, to the Pi ladies uh, last week in Palo Alto, um, some of them said, we thought you joined Tracy and you were just kind of going through design exercises. And I wanted to, so I want to emphasize that one of the reasons that, that what I am talking about actually has, I feel, relevance and value is because she had a working, she has a working system, or, or as you will see, many systems. We have many users, we had production data. Um, the best way that I feel like I could show this was a commit graph over the past year of all the awesome things that she had built. So, um, but this is kind of interesting because there's me, and here's the organization structure at our company. So I report to myself, and, and I manage myself. So um, uh, this also probably has some undertones about our company, and, um, and I think that what, what was unique about this was I wasn't coming up to speed with a large managerial and team. I was both coming up to speed and I was managing myself coming up to speed. So I had this kind of meta role where I was, I was trying to wrap my ha head around Python and Django, but I, at the same time, I, I couldn't go into deep rabbit holes because there was nobody to really like pull myself out. Like, like Tracy was obviously there, but she was full speed ahead on design. And as someone, as like a, as the CTO, as we, as I call myself, which seems silly at a small company, but there wasn't, you know, nobody's there to like check you and like, and like pull you out. So I frequently had to check in with myself and say like, what am I doing? Am I doing this correctly? Um, is there a way that I could do things better? So like I said, to February 2012, I was like, I don't know what the hell's going on. So, but it, but it was an exciting thing. And, I, and like, the, like the dog in this picture, I was, I was enthusiastically optimistic about what was going on. So, um, to what I, to my chagrin. So, um, just to give you a little bit of background of what I was, kind of, I was getting myself into. So, we had at the time five separate Django um, projects each with their own application and database. So um, what this, and this was very problematic because it, I'll, I'll, I'll actually go to the slide, because we had a lot of code repetition. And if you're an engineer, you immediately see code repetition and you're like, no, this is like not a good sign. And it wasn't near code repetition, it was like significant copies of code repetition going on. Um, we had inconsistencies on how we did things from each project to each project. Um, we'd have to log into five different UIs, like I said, and it's also pr probably worth mentioning that the data models for each one of these Django applications were very, very similar. So the code repetition, so all this code is really similar. We've got um, models that are near replicas in five different projects, and you're probably thinking to yourself, like, you know, hindsight is 20, why, why on earth would you do that in the first place? Well, if you're a small startup and you need to launch things, sometimes like you do dirty things and you amass technical debt to get it done, to get your product launch. But we'll talk a little bit more about technical debt later. So, and finally, the real big problem was that if we were gonna grow and we were gonna create more, we have different directories for wedding photographers, people who do invitations, et cetera. If we were gonna grow as a company, this mean, meant that the fragmentation problem was gonna get worse because we would have had to create yet another Django application, which you know, obviously was, was going to blow up in our face. Um, so to, to kind of like hit that lesson home, like technical debt will come due. Um, so this is the situation I was, I was getting myself into. Like we needed to grow, grow and scale the company, we needed to combine these Django applications, but I didn't, I've never written a line of Django in my life. So um, how I learned Django, why you're all here today. Um, so step one, I think all of us are like, oh, we'll immediately just like type this into the Google and I will like learn everything I need to know. And that's, that's I would say a bad idea because if you do do this, obviously Google search results vary if you're logged in or not, but you'll first get the outdated, I did, the outdated Django book um, in my search results. 
And then I got a lot of hits that were a meta discussion about whether or not the Django documentation was good or not. And, and as a beginner, that's not something that's really going to help you understand. So what I did, which was like we're all engineers, step zero, is I went to the community. So I asked a few people in the Django community, and obviously you're here at DjangoCon because you care about Django and you've met a lot of people, so ask them if you have questions. So I said, hey, Kenneth Love, like you're a Django knot. Like, help me out here. How do, I, how do I first start diving into Django? And I went to another friend and said, hey, when you had to learn Django, what did you do? Like, what really worked for you looking back? And um, I put this up here. These slides will be online. I have a link at the end. But you can find this list and you can connect with these people. So I said, like, hey, guys, what do I do? And they all said, like you probably prefer, like, go to the Django tutorial. Like, it's, they told me this is the best way to, like, just really quickly go up to speed. And of course, I went through the wrong version because I didn't understand that the URL linked to different versions. So I put this up here. So when you tell your devs, go look at the tutorial, they can actually be mindful of what version of the tutorial they're learning. There were, uh, there also are videos. Um, as someone who's had to learn marketing like on the streets at a startup, I've learned that there are people who watch videos and there are people who read, um, who prefer to read online. And I never watch videos ever on any website, but I have no many people who do. So the videos are linked here. Kenneth Love is also doing a Kickstarter produ to produce more videos. So I've also linked that there because that did not exist. So all right, cool, like I've done the tutorial, sweet. Like, enlightenment. And, and this is, this is what, not, not at all what happened. And so um, what I observed in myself in going through the tutorials is something that I like to call yeah, yeah, yeah syndrome. So when you understand generally how web frameworks work, you, you read the instructions and you copy paste the code and you're like, and then it connects to the database and you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you, Open it in a browser, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you go on autopilot and you stop paying attention to what's really happening. Um, and I totally, completely did that with polls. And like, I literally like went through the tutorial in 15 minutes, and then I was like, I'm ready to like write Django production code. And like, that that was such, a, a, yeah, that that's not how it worked. So to combat, so this is kind of what happened. So I I felt like I went through polls and. I could build like one highway, two streets, and a building. And I was like, sweet, next, I'm gonna build Washington, D.C. And, and this, this, this is this gap. And so I was like, oh no, oh no. Like, so the, so I, I kind of inherited Washington, D.C. and I wanted to start building on Washington, D.C. knowing how to build three streets and a building. And so I was like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna spend some time looking over the code. And, you know, this is another one of these, like, what, what, what are you thinking? So obviously there is some value in looking over code, but looking over code to me generally means it's like learning how to program by reading a programming book at night before you go to bed, but never using a computer. Like th this is, it fundamentally doesn't make any sense. And so the way I feel like to really learn production quality code is that somebody else is gonna be consuming this code. So we had, as I mentioned, many end users and we had pr production systems and five beautiful Postgres databases. And so, you know, I needed to start writing code quickly to fix bugs. So um, the first thing that I did after tutorials and after I realized that I couldn't like just start building Washington DC was I fixed a bug. And this kind of seems maybe a little bit obvious, but something I really learned in fixing one of our bugs was that it will, it will significantly help you if you're upfront with your new devs about debugging practices. So we're software engineers, we've been debugging all our lives, we've been writing print statements in code since eternity, but what do you do and how do you debug when things get bad and when they get hairy and you have no idea what to do? Um, I remember years ago I used to write Java in Eclipse and there were these nice buttons and I could press them to debug and now I'm, I, could, I could print stack do, or, or output all of the, the state of my variables and now I'm in Vim and I'm writing Python and I'm like, you know, how, how do I get the same level of debugging? And so I'm not gonna go too deep into how to debug because I feel like that's a very, that's special to your organization. Everybody has different apps to do different things and has different debugging needs. Um, I, I, I put one reference to here to the Django debug toolbar, which I had no idea existed, but then when I found it, I was like, this man should 
you know, be saint, like, what is it? He should have sainthood for this amazing thing. So if he's here, thank you. He's probably listening next door. Um, but so the, the, here's an interesting thing, right? So don't just choose like any old bug because I, I had no idea coming from a different programming paradigm that Django had so many packages and had this mentality of, oh, you want to build that feature? Like, look, there may be a package for that first. And so the bug that I ended up fixing was with Django registration. And so I started digging deep into Django registration and I had to make this key decision about do I fork the code or do I override methods myself? And so understanding package structure of how you use external packages and how you bring them in and what happens when you need to change functionality, I think that will be very important for your organization. Um, I also link to Django packages here because in case your devs are saying, oh, I, I think that we actually, we need to build this later on when, you'll build, when you're building a feature, here's an amazing list of all the packages, but since we're talking about packages, Huzzah. Um, now, now we'll go to step three. So I fixed this bug. I was like, deployed it into production and I celebrated. And then um, I decided, okay, now I'm, I want to build a feature. I want to get my hands more dirty on this. So I chose single sign on with Etsy. So um, we have a lot of users that have Etsy accounts. And if you have a business, you want to make it very, very easy for any potential user to sign up for your service. And so you often will have these single sign-ons. So I was like, okay, sweet. I'm just gonna like build this quick, easy feature that involves exciting, exciting moving ports, such as OAuth2, our good friend, um, third-party APIs, as I mentioned, parsing data, and finally, the need for good error handling because Everyone knows if you use third-party APIs and those APIs go down and your users are using your site, they think it's your fault and they begin to hate you. So you need to have good handling of those situations. Um, and this was actually, I thought this was pretty cool because I, I had learned at that point, like, okay, cool, Django, there's a million packages for everything under the sun. I'll just Google and I'll find a package and then I'll like plop it in and Celebrate, and I did find a package, and I brought it in, and I implemented our, the code, and then I realized about 75% of the way through that it didn't do everything I wanted it to do. And so I ended up at that point rewriting a bunch of the code myself, having understood first how somebody else did it. So now this is a little bit, I'm gonna say something that, that may be a little bit scandalous, probably not that scandalous, I think you guys are excited. Um, so I, while I'm building this feature, it was a pain in the ass to debug because I'm building it. It's like you're building something in the middle of a city and there's like cars rushing by and then it breaks and you don't know if something your, some of the code, the, the new feature you're implementing has broken or if you don't, or, or if the large, you've broke something in the larger infrastructure that you've you're, you've just seen and you have no idea how it really works has broken. And so what I did was I built my feature as a standalone Django project. So I had this like aha moment in this process where I was like, I still have, like I've built, I've, I've fixed this bug, like I've gone through the tutorial, but I really fundamentally don't understand how Django works. And so I went off and I built a standalone Django project. And, I, I will tell you straight up, that, is, that was the most like, influential learning experience of my life because I thought it would be so easy because like, I, I wrote polls, you know, and polls is, is so trivial. And, and, and it is, but then if you want to build something fundamentally different, like a user form that takes data, that calls the API and nicely displays it, like that, that's from scratch, that's a little bit tricky. So I built it as a standalone project. So I know a lot of you are thinking like, holy crap, I work at a startup. We don't have time for people to be building their own Django projects. We don't want code fragmentation. But as I put here, like, Vodizen does this in the interview process. So if you want to go work there, you have to build a Django project uh, as a take-home coding experience. And I think it's something like a blog. And so they train you to build a project. And second, I would argue, you know, as as a company, we, there are a million internal metrics that I wish that I could see every day. And so if I had somebody um, that I was interviewing come in and I said, okay, take today, 
look at our database, build a, sing a simple Django project that shows me how many customers are signing up each day, where they're coming from, what their conversion rates are, all these things so that I don't have to write SQL queries every single day to get this data. So I would encourage you to at least have someone go through the process of doing this, whether that be in the interview or like the first day when they sign up, just have them build something. Um, and no Django magic. So next I had another big epiphany. So this is Python, and this is the amount of Python that I learned when I was writing Django. So obviously, if you're going to build Django applications, you write them in Python. And I've written in many languages. I'm like, no problem. I'll just pick this up super quick. And there, and there were things that were very obvious and very intuitive. And then there were times when I was like, I don't know what the hell is going on with this like list of tuples. And so I would encourage you to um, learn a little Python in your life. Um, and I put some uh, of the resources that I found. So a lot of people will you know, go and read an entire book. And I found that when I go buy books, what usually happens is I then take them to our office, and then someone's like, oh, my monitor is too low. And so, like, there's the book. And then, then you can never use the book because you don't want to give that person some sort of like ergonomic nightmare. So, um, so I, I obviously found it online resources a lot easier. And by the way, these are all free. So I downloaded that book for free, and I searched it. And the reason that I'm giving you some of these things, and I'm not just saying like Google every time and go to Stack Overflow every single time, is because you know, you'll incrementally understand how to do things, but sometimes it's nice to just sit down and read like what the hell a list does. Like when is it, imp what, what are the memory implications of using a list versus a dictionary? Like are you using C Python or Java Python? Like some of these things they are, are fundamentals that it's nice to know. And I think I benefited from upfront just like sitting down one day, spent a few hours, read, read through this. And finally I printed off a nice reference and hung it above my desk. I think that one's about two pages. So, um, so finally, you know, so I'm like, all right, I'm rock and rolling. So the, as engineers, we know the only way you really understand something is you break it and then you have to fix it. Or in my case, I, I, try, I started to tackle our crazy um, Django project fragmentation program problem by breaking everything. So this is what I tried to do. And I, I it, it was quite, it was, yeah, that was the month of my life that I think I'm, I may never get back, but um, so I took, I was like, all right, Django hosts, we have five different URLs for all these Django projects. I'll use Django hosts, I'll route to, I'll just stick all of them into one Django project, all the applications, I'll use Django hosts to route requests to each one, and I'll just keep five separate Postgres databases, and I'll do database routing. Um, and this was all designed to be a Band-Aid fix, where just get it all into one Django project, upgrade to one for, and then I will slowly deal with code fragmentation, we'll migrate the data. And this like totally and completely blew up in my face. <laughs> uh, and, and why did it fail? So it failed because I didn't understand how things like auth, user, tag it, and Django comments worked. Um, and that they're all shared by all of the applications in the project. And so it was, I, I felt like I started to come to terms with Django internals because I could not get this damn stuff to work. And it was, it was kind of funny. Something happened to me that had never happened to me before where I posted a question on Stack Overflow when I started getting con d problems with Tagit where um, Django was selecting the wrong database even though I had set up database routing. And someone had said in the Stack Overflow comment that you know, I was going into like the depths where no one had gone before. <laughs> and, I was, and at that stage I was like, oh my god, like this is, this is not going to work. And, I need to, this was, this was supposed to be a Band-Aid fix anyway. So at that point, you know, you have to rise from the fail ashes. And I, I took a step back and I thought, you know, how, how am I going to do this? I've broken everything. What's better? And as engineers, we often see a mess and, like, we make a bigger mess and then we're like, I want to throw it all away. And there's always this need, this, like, urge as an engineer to, like, throw all your code out and start fresh. And in the end, that is what I finally had to do is, like, is I took all of those Django apps and I, I rebuilt them into one. And that, that was also a very formative life experience, as I would say. Um, using Django hosts, uh, I, I learned a lot about the importance of 
site IDs in Django, especially if you have five of them and you have one Django application. And so even, or one Django project, excuse me. And so even as of yesterday, I was dealing with the joys of site IDs. Um, when I gave this, I, I'm going a little fast, I'm just, I'm so excited um, <laughs> to talk about, about this to you guys. Um, so I gave this talk as a practice talk a week ago to the Pi ladies in Palo Alto. And I, I, I had ended the talk here saying, you know, we, I, I rebuilt this, um, always tell someone to break some code. And the Pi ladies were like, what happened to the data? Like, how could you not tell us how the data migration went? So I, I, long story short, I, we had to migrate the data from five databases to one, and that was not something I decided to do in Django, and I ended up using SQL Alchemy, which is a different ORM, and I wrote a Python script. Um, and I would encourage you that if you are doing, so this was also one of these like learning experiences of my life where I feel like I like went to war with the data and then like I came back and I, I, felt, I felt victorious and then later you're like, oh, but by the way, your house is burning down. So, uh, so if you, and this is, I, I apologize for being slightly off topic, but if you are gonna have someone do data migrations, please, and, and you think to yourself like, I'm only gonna migrate the data once, like, we don't need to have tests, <laughs> so, so please think about um, including tests when you do do data migrations because we basically, we migrated the data and we like looked it over and we were like, oh sweet, like we declared success and then, <laughs> then about a week later we realized that some of our tag it tags didn't migrate properly and you know, at that point we're running on a new database and I'm having to patch in data and then yesterday we had another problem. So, um, I, would, I would say please do always test, but even test when you think you're only gonna ever do something once because you're n you never do something once and you always reuse that code again. So um, at that point, the talk ends and um, I put all these slides on the internet and they are there now so that you could have all the links um, and you can always tweet me now that, now that you're like, ask the community, Julia said step zero, like, please feel free to ask me. I, I'm sure if you had any Django questions, I could point you in the right direction. You could speak with somebody else in the community and thus talk is concluded. So. So now we enter the Q&A section of the, not evening, afternoon. Um, yeah, so if you had to pick one piece of advice um, to someone who's like, I'm starting at a company and they use Django and uh, what's this Python thing? Like, what, would, I what would you tell them? I would say build a Django application that is not polls, that is something else. Like I, I really, I mean I think that when I say that advice <laughs> and I give it, I, I know people are like, oh, what a, like, They'll just pick it up by writing, but like I could have saved myself so much if I just, and I'm not even talking about like, oh, well, everybody else who's done with polls builds a blog, I'll build a blog. Like, think of something else in your own life or your company that would be valuable to build a Django application for. Like, even just some simple data waste queries. Like, I think that's so key to, to build something that doesn't have a spec already rewritten, that doesn't have code already there that you can copy and paste, and it would have, it, it would have been a simple thought exercise that would have like totally saved my self. <laughs> so it totally would have helped save me a lot of time. So that's my, my key thing. Hey, Julia, hi. I have two questions. The first one is about scaling. How do you know when was time to scale? And for you, what was your bottleneck? So based on your experience, how do you know when was time to add a new database or not? What was your experience for that? So, um, in terms of scaling, when you have five databases that you need to query on to get key metrics about your business, um, and, this, and there's no reason that these databases should ha house different data, and you're, basic, you're doing SQL queries that you're then like catting and sorting on the command line, like that's bad news. Um, I think that, you know, obviously the nature of a lot of our businesses is we're going to have many databases, and they're going to hold different data. But if you can, if there are very important key, as I say, like metrics and numbers about your company or about the project that you're building, 
um, I would encourage you to make that situation as, as easy to query as possible. Uh -huh. And the second one is about A-B testing and metrics. So of course it's a startup, so you need to measure everything, right? And so how do you do A-B testing in the, if you do it? Front end, back end, so how, what do you measure? And <laughs> if you have a strategy or uh, what I mean, do you decide to, to measure? So there's, when people say A-B te testing, they often think like, oh my god, I need to like install a framework to do A-B testing, or I need to use like this other company. And you can do those things, or you can just like for one day change out a page and the next day change another page. And like there are things that, like that kind of like bleeds into the entrepreneurship thing, but there are things, so when we, we've built, met, we built more Django applications since this. I know it's hard to believe, you're like even more, more <laughs> Django. Um, and a lot of the time you, you, you go with your gut and your gut is usually wrong and so then you tweak and, and you test with your base and you know, if you, if you, if you see low conversion, you know you need to A-B test or you know you need to do something better. And so, I mean, we do things like cheap and easy. And at the, as a small company, that's what you have to do. So you built everything in-house, right? I'm sorry? You built everything in-house or you didn't use any external tools? We, we built everything in-house. What was the second part? Yeah, you mean you didn't use like Kiss Metrics or Spring Metrics or this? I mean, if you, you should use Google Analytics, oh, okay, okay. We, we do that. Okay. So. As I'm sure everybody does. Thank so. you. Okay, so the oldest and probably worst joke in the Django docs is the end of tutorial four where it says, coming soon, other tutorials. tutorials. Um, <laughs> there is actually a draft for tutorial five. It's sitting, it's sitting in a ticket somewhere, cool. so which is cool. worth looking at. But the question I've actually got is, okay, you, you're talking about the experience of coming on board and obviously the tutorials end a long way before you're a functioning software engineer using Django as your day yes. job. Yes. What else could we put in that we haven't got? Just seeding the idea because, hey, we've got sprints coming up in a couple of days. Uh, and people who are, like yourself, newer to Django that, are better yeah. people to write yeah. tutorials because you know what we don't yeah. know. Uh, or you know, you, don't, you, you know what was hard to find out. What, what should we be putting into the tutorials? So or what I steps should we have? Absolutely. I think that's a fantastic question. And this is something I've talked with Jeremy. He's at the end of the line there. Um, so this is, so, when you go through the tutorial and you're an engineer, you're like, okay, cool, like, what happens when I need to change my data model? How do I migrate my database? And so at that, like, like I think there are key things, like, how do I deploy? Let's say that I'm interested in using Heroku, like, that's not what we use, but that's a cheap and easy way to get my app so that I can show my friends. Like, what is, what would go along? Or I need to do, like, testing is so important. How do I start to do some testing? I think those are kind of like key things. As engineers that you think of at the end of the tutorial, you're like, okay, sweet, now we're going next to, like, to data migration. And so I think that there are simple and easy answers to those things, like use South for data migrations, but like you, you, you wouldn't have any idea. The tutorials don't tell you that, and I know that you want to be package ag agnostic, and you don't want to say, go use this thing, but look here for how to do data migrations. Look here for how to do deployment. We, as maybe the Django Software Foundation, aren't going to say everyone should use Heroku or Linode or AWS, but here are some ways to you know, show off your newly minted Django knowledge. Um, I think that would be really key, or like how to test. And I actually think that, um, Having written, having to rewrite the Etsy package, going to Mark's talk yesterday about how to open source code was like really eye opening because I've obviously used a lot of packages, but I've never open sourced anything and I would love to open source that package. So let's say you're like, hey guys, and by the way, you're into Django now and you've written something cool, so open source it to the community and like here's the talk and here's the here's how to do that like i think those that, things that's would be mostly great. what tutorial 5 the draft is about so. i'm sorry the, the the tutorial 5 draft that is there that's oh, mostly what that's about i mean so. I, I and i hope that's useful feedback but i think that would be like awesome i think even more people would be deploying awesome django stuff so cool so yeah just uh, everyone were you listening there's things to do on the sprints in the week this is coming up so <laughs> Thanks, thanks for your talk. Um, somewhat related, Russell stole a little bit of the thunder, but do you think that, going deeper on that question, do you think that a, the, the, one of the answers to that is possibly sort of having a better annotated existing tutorial, or perhaps a somewhat, I mean, not to make it more complex, but maybe intermediate kind of tutorial? Tutorial, yeah, for or, different archetypes. You know, like what, yeah. what, 
for people who find that as their main entry point, um, what's the easiest way to get them to do. off that, you know, to say like, to, to avoid the point where you say like, you know, they, they, they glaze over and yeah, 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 I got this. And to get them onto something more substantive. What, what do you think the easiest? So I think that you, I, I would never solve the problem with more, tu more tutorial fragmentation, meaning like you don't want someone to Google because I know inevitably everyone will, and they'll, they'll end up on like the advanced tutorial by accident when they're a beginner. So I think having that single tutorial is, is good. And then something that we have talked, that I've talked with Jeremy about is like how to split off, like if you want more information, go here. Or if you're, if you're thinking like, and I know that this does happen a little bit in line, like oh, the, the, the job of the tutorial isn't to dis describe what query sets are, but if you need to know about query sets, go to this other place. But I, I think that, you know, there's some knowledge. So when, as an engineer, I think when you go through those tutorials, you start, and, and the tutorial was invaluable as a reference later on, but as, as I have obviously shown, did not like enable me to get on, get deep in because I was on autopilot. But later on, I refer to that tutorial all the time. And I'll often go to those notes and say, okay, that's how I do this. Because I, I have this like pointer, you know, this variable pointer in my head that says, the tutorial said that I could go here, so now I know to go to the tutorial to do that. So I think if there were some way to include um, at least like call outs or, or pointers to something else. Thanks. Uh, it's not really a question, but a suggestion for what we're doing is um, I think when people come to Django or to the open source ethos, right, it's not obvious. Like we all have norms of what to do. And uh, so IRC, like I, you know, hey, get on IRC if you're doing open source stuff. Uh, but just generally, you know, uh, Django users as a mailing list, the IRC yeah. channel, essentially getting connected into the community is really valuable because we're all volunteers and we're all, like, basically our incremental self-interest is a benefit to the community. And yeah. so, uh, you know, the fact that you didn't bounce off and go to something else is, that's why you're on stage now, right? And so if that could, basically if we could just, like, uh, as people come in, uh, sort of build the fabric, right? To, to know that Russ is a really helpful guy that's yeah. smart and done all this sort of thing. And, you know, uh, that's a good thing to do. And I think that we currently don't do a good enough job of that. So. Yeah, no, I think that's a good, I think that's a good point. And I think there's even more. I mean, I think it's a balance between, like, a lot of people think, like, I'm going to learn this and then, like, I'll be done and then, I will like profit, and I, I think that you, you don't realize that it's is you know it's a it's a continued investment, and you don't realize the roadblocks that you're going to face. Not because the technology is hard, but just because that's the nature of programming and learning. And so I think that uh, so I would love to include those. I will I will put links on on this talk so that future viewers can see it. So good, very good points. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, first, I want to say. Thanks, I'm glad you enjoyed my talk yesterday. <laughs> uh, and you touched on, or you, you mentioned testing, um, both in, in response to Russell's question and in your migration talk. Do you have any tips or stumbling blocks that you came across in Django testing? I think there are some uh. things that people run into. I yeah. wonder what those were for you. So I think it was, like when I read the, page about Django testing, and they're like, there are two ways to do testing. Both of these are great. I'm like, oh, great. Like, first, now I need to make a decision. Like, what, what am I going to do? Like, what, what is the preferred way? And so I think at that point, I was like, holy crap, who do I talk to to say, like, what might be better given the application that we're trying to build and the code base that we're trying to maintain? Is there, is one of these ways to approach testing better? So, like, I've honestly messed with a few of them, and testing is still something that we're trying to do right and trying to do well and it's been really hard and I think that I think that what has happened in 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 hindsight is that you 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 build when there's not so when I learned to do Ruby on Rails like testing was like the, uh, weaved in the whole discussion and I think they kind of like oh, did a little bit of overkill on the testing but at least I was like okay like I get it like I know how to test all the time and I think what happened with Django was I was like I, I committed like the horrific software developer mistakes that none of us never want to admit to, where you're like, I'll write the test later. <laughs> and, so, and so a lot of that has gone on, and now I'm trying to fix that, and it's really scary and horrible <laughs> to do, but really important. 
So I think that's my spiel on that. And thank you. That is Mark who gave the open source talk that I've been referring to. He did a great job. Um, so um, I've worked with a lot of um, high school and college students on, on teaching Django, and one cool. of the issues we found was that was that a lot of the, the, the built-in documentation tutorials talk about you know like pick where you want your templates directory or pick yes. where you want to do yeah. like the, the issue is, is I think the issue is like where can we have a set like these are the your best practices of where to put your templates or where to put do you do you agree that that's a problem and and if so oh, how, I mean, how would I you think fix it I I absolutely agree it's a problem and I think that there's a balance between Django wanting to be an agnostic and, and a place that doesn't prefer one test method of testing over another to what is the best way to do it. And I think that where you start to lose people is when you present them with a lot of choices that are all equally good. I mean, so there's a bunch of research for this, right? Like if you go to the grocery store and there's a thousand flavors of ice cream, a lot of people like buy none because they can't decide which ice cream to buy. And I think this is exactly what's going on here. Um, and I would also say that like for teaching younger people, and I, I've, I've done some of this myself, like when they giving them, so this is why I think building the Django application is, is, is key and why I keep saying that is because you have a pro, like there's a problem you want to solve. Like the, the high schoolers might be like, oh, I want to like build something really cool to like show my friends my baseball statistics. And so there's like something you actually want to do that is not blogs and polls and like, I don't know, whatever people do, like, like it, libra build a library or something like that. So, so I think that's, um, so giving like clear, and then like, oh, if you want to research this more, you can come back. So yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's Thank a you. Deal. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Julia. Um, Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah.